A son is devastated when he finds his mother burned beyond recognition. This is a bizarre case. What really is going on? Now, it's up to Dr. G to figure out who set her on fire. What a tragedy. I think it's incredibly sad. Then, a young man dies tragically under mysterious circumstances. Is it suicide? Is it a natural? Is it something else? But at autopsy, Dr. G makes a shocking discovery. I'm pretty sure I may have the smoking gun. Altered lives, baffling medical mysteries, shocking revelations. These are the everyday cases of Dr. G, medical examiner. Inside Central Florida's District 9 morgue, sudden death often starts out as a mystery. I don't know what that's all about. When you have a case that you're not sure which direction it's going to go, you just want to get the answer, and you hope it's not something too weird. What is going on with this guy? On the other hand, sometimes you really like those cases, and you wonder, where is this going to lead? Oh, wait a minute. This is interesting. But very few are as shocking as Dr. G's next case. Sad, sad case, I think. No matter how this turns out, this is a horrific case. The whole scene, from what they're telling me, is bizarre. And the police clearly think this is suspicious at this point. It's 4 PM on a lazy Saturday afternoon. And Victor Petrova is checking his email when he hears a strange noise coming from his mother's room. Mom? Her son finds her moaning in her bedroom on the floor. She is barely conscious and in agonizing pain. What's disturbing is that she's burnt. Her hair is completely burnt off, and her clothes are completely charred off of her body. The son is baffled of what happened. And it was just kind of a bizarre, surreal scene for that poor kid. At that moment, the paramedic burst onto the scene because someone called 911. But the son didn't call 911. And it's a com really a complete mystery who did. They assess her, but she cannot speak at this point, doesn't really react to anything they say. They whisk her to the hospital. Olga is immediately admitted to the ICU where doctors furiously work to save her life. But she's got about 95% total body surface burns all over. They felt she had no chance of making it. And they were right, about 11 hours later, she died. Clearly, families do not have time to prepare for these sudden, kind of unexpected death, whether it be natural or this horrific kind of death. And I think they're in shock. Like, how could this happen? Olga's body is transported to the District 9 morgue, and police immediately launch a full-scale investigation. Just out of the gate, this is a bizarre case. Is this a homicide? What really is going on? It's very rare to get somebody murdered by setting them on fire. This is like literally setting someone on fire, torching them on purpose. That's unusual. As investigators examine Olga's home, a gruesome scenario begins to emerge. Detectives, they are baffled because they see pieces of burnt skin on the ground and even drops of blood but really nothing that looks like she burned or caught on fire in that bedroom. So then they follow the trail of blood and burnt skin and it goes back out to the garage, right to the driver's side of the car. And there's drops of blood and charred material on the driver's seat and on the steering wheel. There's nothing else in the car burnt 
So she must have been burned somewhere else. But where'd she get burned? Police conduct a thorough search of the neighborhood, and it's not long before they strike gold. The crime scene investigators were able to find a field where there's a patch of dirt that was burnt, and a burnt cigarette lighter was found, and blood and skin that had fallen off. Uh, so she clearly um, was burnt about mm, half a mile away from the house. It's bizarre to think that she then got into the car and drove. You wonder if she was trying to escape from someone. And he ran off, and she still had her car. With few clues to go on, detectives turn to Olga's 20-year-old son, Victor, in hopes of learning anything they possibly can about what happened. Now, the son says they immigrated here from Bulgaria. She owns a clothing store. But it started going under. She's been very upset because her fiance didn't have a steady job, and she was very anxious uh, about their financial situation. Apparently, on the day of her death, the tension between the couple reaches a boiling point. According to the son, they were arguing a lot, and they left together in the car, still arguing. He didn't really hear her come back. And the next thing he knows, he hears her moaning in the bedroom while paramedics are knocking on the door. Immediately, they're suspecting, guess who, the fiance. Keep in mind that 30% of the women that are murdered are killed by an intimate partner. It's certainly not uncommon here in the morgue to see that. Police are determined to track down Olga's fiance, Boris Ivanov, but there's one problem. At this point, nobody knows where he is. They're trying to find him, but he appears to have disappeared, and they're worried he may have gone back to Bulgaria. In the meantime, it's up to Dr. G and her team to help get to the bottom of this horrific death and find justice for Olga. So I'll see what the body tells me, but we're gonna treat it like a homicide until proven otherwise. Dr. G braces herself for what promises to be a disturbing and grisly autopsy, that of 44-year-old Olga Petrova, whose body was mysteriously set on fire. This is gonna be a tough one. Unfortunately, I have to see burn victims. It is a horrendous sight. I don't like it. I don't like these cases. And police immediately suspect Olga's fiance, Boris Ivanov, had something to do with her death. The son says they were arguing over money and he thought that the fiance and the mom left together. And then he didn't come back. And yet she came back burnt. It's just very suspicious. Did he do anything to her? Uh, did he try to choke her? Did he hit her? And then is trying to hide that with burning her? Law enforcement's trying to track him down. They're worried these mysteriously disappeared. But the police have a lot of investigation to do. Meanwhile, I'll do the autopsy and see uh, what I find. Oh, boy. Overall, when you look at her, it just looks painful. Her hair is completely burnt off. She's got pieces of burnt, charred, clothing still present on her. Some of her skin is black. Some of it's kind of tan and bubbly and, 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 and almost leathery. And that's all over. She also has terrible burns on her mouth, her airway, inside of her nose. But despite the gruesome condition of the body, Dr. G smells no trace of an accelerant used to start the fire. Ah, oh, I got it on my hand. I was able to recover several pieces of partially charred clothing that were still kind of stuck to her. These will be handed over to law enforcement and they can test it for accelerant. 
but for now, she must stay focused to find more clues. Certainly, we're gonna look at the pattern of burn and really document that carefully. And it's not long before something odd catches her eye. Although they described from the hospital that she has 100% total body surface burns, that actually wasn't true. The bottom of her feet were completely spared, and the entire palm of the right hand was spared. This is bizarre. I don't know, Sandy. Dr. G is puzzled, but pushes on with the autopsy, eyes peeled for any signs of suspicious trauma. We were going to look for evidence uh, that an altercation occurred. Maybe it got out of control. So we look at the body very carefully, and I just don't see anything except these severe burns. But Dr. G must continue her search for signs of foul play inside the body, starting with the head. You never know what you're going to find internally. And oftentimes, there's surprises. What I'm looking for is evidence of trauma, um, pure and simple. Blow to the back of the head's a possibility. So we go ahead and uh, do the incision uh, behind the ears from ear to ear. It, it's a little harder to reflect that scalp because it's so burnt. Uh, but there is no evidence of any contusions, and we don't see skull fracture. Has nothing. Not a thing. All right. Let's look at her brain. Okay. I remove her calvarium to look at the brain. Uh, nothing much in her brain. And it looks fine. So no trauma. Not in the head. Okay, let me open her. I'll go ahead and do it. Now we've got to look very closely at the entire body. Dr. G makes the standard Y incision across Olga's chest. But I really don't see anything. No rib fractures and no injuries. She looks pretty normal. But where I think the money might be is the neck. Do you get it? I would look for strangulation. We know that didn't kill her because uh, she's alive uh, when paramedics got there. But that'll help us uh, determine if maybe there was a fight going on. So I layer by layer dissect off the muscles to look for any kind of subtle areas of hemorrhage to indicate somebody holding her neck or something on her neck. I look at the hyoid bone, that, that kind of U-shaped bone that these neck muscles are attached to. And we often see that broken uh, strangulation. Oh boy. Her vocal cords are just burnt white and hard. She had insurvivable injuries. But there is no hemorrhage. There's nothing in her neck. She had no evidence of strangulation. She wasn't strangled. So she was not burnt to try to hide some other trauma. She clearly died from the burns. But at the end of the autopsy, we still don't know if he set her on fire or not. And there's also a mystery here that we can't figure out. She's totally burnt except for the palm of her hand and the bottom of her feet. And then there's that whole, who called 911? I mean, was it her? Was it a neighbor? Was it the fiance? I'm not so sure what's going on. And on this case, I'm not so sure the autopsy is going to tell the story of what happened. But just as Dr. G is wrapping up the autopsy, she gets a call Poor from Dr. police. G. And what they tell her about Boris Ivanov turns the case upside down. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, take a deep breath. I, I just can't believe this. It paints a whole different picture. Dr. G has just received a phone call from police who have finally tracked down Olga's fiance, Boris Ivanov. 
I hate to be pre prejudicial, but I can't imagine anybody doing this to her besides her fiance. And what authorities right, reveal bye -bye. stops everyone dead in their tracks. I was really shocked. Fiance was totally exonerated. According to the detectives, he had a clear cut alibi uh, that uh, he wasn't involved and he uh, had a story that could be substantiated. And in a stunning twist, Boris makes an astonishing revelation. Honestly, for me, it's out of the blue. It's not what I expected. I can finally put the pieces of the puzzle together. According to Boris, in the days leading up to her death, Olga Petrova's life was rapidly spiraling out of control. Creditors are repeatedly calling her, and her business is failing. She owns a clothing store, and it looks like she was going to have to close it. And she was very anxious about the fact that her fiancé didn't have a steady job. This was weighing heavily on her. They were arguing a lot. And it sounded like she was really, the stress was getting to her. That's when Olga suddenly makes a chilling and shocking proposal. According to the fiance, she actually wanted the two of them to commit suicide together. Wanted him to go in on a suicide pact with her and was quite angry when he didn't want any part of it. He didn't think she was serious. So he leaves the house and she takes off in the car. Despite what the son said, they don't leave together. Boris goes to his mother's house while Olga drives to a nearby field. And Dr. G recalls two clues from the external exam. The bottom of her feet and the palm of her right hand was not burnt. Based on these clues, Dr. G thinks she has the answer. From what we can tell, she sets herself on fire with a lighter. We were never able to find accelerant. Investigators didn't find any accelerant at the scene. They also tested her clothing, but the results were negative. The reason her feet and hands are burned is because she's standing and her hand is clasped around the lighter. So those areas are not exposed to the flame. It appears she went up very quickly. Uh, her hair is completely burnt off. Uh, her clothes are singed off of her. For whatever reason, she decides to drive herself back to her house. Uh, maybe she's surprised that she didn't die as fast as she thought she would. She pulls in the driveway, makes her way into her house with burning clothes falling off of her, burnt skin falling off of her. And while she's in the bedroom, she tries to call 911 from her phone. <laughs> Olga's vocal cords are severely burned, but she is able to whisper her address. She probably changed her mind. Uh, I don't think it's that unusual in some suicide cases. They do send paramedics there immediately, but by the time they get there, she couldn't survive. And within about 11 hours, she died. It's shocking that somebody would set themselves on fire. I find that a horrendous way to commit suicide. And it is very rare in the United States. This is way down on the radar. For Olga's son, Victor, the truth about his mother's tragic death is cold comfort. Well, the son has is, is got emotional trauma. I mean, not only did his mom commit suicide, he had to see this horrific sight of his mom completely burnt, moaning on the ground. It is just an incredible sadness. This is a case you don't readily forget. She clearly, at the end, wanted help, but she was too far gone. No one could help her. The hardest cases to me are suicides. I mean, none of my cases are joyful by far, um, but at least with homicides, you're giving them a voice so justice can be done uh, for them. With suicide, 
You're just documenting their sadness and their desperation. In addition to being a memorable case, Dr. G believes it teaches an important lesson. Never underestimate uh, people's feelings and their desperation and their hopelessness. You know, reach out to your fellow man and, and, and talk to them. And, and if they are suffering, try to convince them to get help. Dr. G is all too familiar with senseless tragedy, but her next case threatens to take an even darker turn. Today's case is a 35-year-old African-American gentleman. The police are worried that he met foul play, and hopefully, with this case, I'll come up with an answer. It's a chilly spring morning in St. Cloud, Florida and Letitia Johnson is waiting for her ex-husband, Terrell Daniels, to pick up their son. The ex-wife got really worried because he didn't pick up their child for his visit, which he's usually pretty good about. And uh, she couldn't get in contact with him pretty much all day. So the next morning, she goes over there. The door was ajar, and she finds him face down in his apartment. And as Letitia gets closer, she makes a horrible realization. Terrell isn't breathing. She immediately calls 911. Emergency personnel are by his side within minutes, but it's too late. Terrell is pronounced dead on the scene. No signs of life. He's clearly been there for a while. <laughs> Police immediately secure the area while they wait for Dr. G's medical investigator, Bill Stratton, to arrive. My main responsibility as a medical investigator is to respond to the scenes, collect the information from the police agency, from the witnesses, provide photographic documentation of the scene, and then build a report that the medical examiner can look at and review. When I first walked into the apartment, one of the windows in the apartment was broken. The place was very messy. Uh, there's liquor bottles laying on their sides, empty beer bottles, clothing scattered. Uh, some of the furniture was out of place. Uh, very, very unkempt in a disarray fashion. So right away, that leads you to suspect there may have been some type of a uh, struggle. So the, initially, we're looking at the possibility of this gentleman's death being a homicide. The police get very anxious on those cases. They like it when I do those cases quickly and give them some answers. Is it a homicide, or could there be another explanation? For Dr. G, there's only one way to find out. We're just not going to know until we get him into the morgue. By the time the body of 35-year-old Terrell Daniels arrives at the District 9 morgue, Dr. G's day is already in full swing. Well, we were doing the first autopsy. Dr. Stephanie and I are doing the first autopsies, and uh, it's a little tough. But you know, we're 24 hours, seven days a week. We can't not shut down uh, to, uh, to stop work. So we'll get it done. These guys are really industrious. Sandy's a barrel of energy in spite of her age, and she's <laughs> That's right. Okay. I'm reminded that I was at everything. <laughs> but suspected homicides are always a high priority. All right, let me go start this guy while you're doing that. The police are worried that he met foul play. He was found dead in his apartment, which is in a terrible disarray. The door was open. The window was broken, which is why the police are highly suspicious all right, let's see here, let's see here. Dr. G turns to the investigator's report. 
hoping it will shed some light on Terrell's sudden death. But instead, it provides a tragic glimpse into his life. We know from the wife that this poor fellow wasn't on a good trajectory. He's got bipolar disease. That's a shame. Bipolar disorder is a psychiatric disorder in people that suffer from both depression and these manic episodes. The sad part about this is that he wasn't being treated uh, for his bipolar disease. And that's not that uncommon. A lot of times, people don't want to be treated. And, that, and that's a shame. Unfortunately, Dr. G knows all too well that there is a more troubling side to this psychiatric disorder. With bipolar disorder, you have an increased risk of substance abuse. Almost 50% of bipolars have a problem with drugs and alcohol. So it's a disease that can really ruin your life. And according to his ex-wife, Leticia, Terrell Daniels was no exception. He clearly is in a, a downward spiral. We know he's a drinker. Alcohol kills you in more ways than you know. We know that he abuses prescription meds, and we know he abuses cocaine, which is one of the reasons she ended up leaving him. He's got drugs all over the place. So I can't rule out overdose. This guy is just really walking the tightrope with this lifestyle. But there is another, more disturbing scenario. We know that bipolars have a very high rate of suicide. In fact, about 10 to 20% of bipolars will actually commit suicide. It's a huge problem. Is it suicide? At this point, we don't know. It's just one possibility. But the bottom line is that foul play is still high on Dr. G's list. When you're buying cocaine and, you know, just uh, hanging out with the local drunks, I mean, you can run into a bad element. And, you know, the nicest people in the world aren't the guys that sell you cocaine. So there's a lot of possibilities. Everything from homicide to suicide to accidental death, either from trauma or alcohol or drug abuse. Maybe it's not so sudden. That looks so bad to me. Hmm. When I see him for the first time, he doesn't look that bad. Uh, he's got jeans that are moderately dirty. His fingernails, you could a little bit getting long, there's dirt under the nails, but I've seen worse. Next, she checks for the telltale signs of drug abuse. But I don't see any evidence of illicit drug use from either injection or snorting cocaine. Doesn't mean he doesn't do it though. So I can't rule out accidental overdose or suicide. Okay, I guess you can undress him. With a careful eye, Dr. G inspects Terrell's body for any bruises or contusions consistent with an assault. I don't really see any clear evidence that he was in a struggle, uh, but he does uh, you know, have somewhat dark skin, and it would be difficult to see some subtle uh, bruising. He's got a lot of hair. Yeah. I try to palpate his head. It looks like he may have a contusion, but he's got a pretty thick head of hair. So we can't say for sure what's going on. I don't feel anything on that head. To completely rule out trauma to the head, Dr. G will have to wait for the cranial exam. In the meantime, she's determined to leave no stone unturned in her search for clues. Yeah, I think he needs an x-ray. Since we were worried about a gunshot wound, we did do an x-ray of his head and just x-rayed his whole body. Yeah, take him in the x-ray and do the head, because I, I still, there's a chance it's in the brain. I'm just not sure what we're going to find. But no one is more anxious to close this case than Terrell's ex-wife, Leticia. She felt terrible uh, that he had died. They had a child together. She obviously still cared for him. She's very worried that somebody killed him, and I'm hoping I'll be able to give her an answer.
get this up? <sighs> yeah, there he is. Dr. G believes that 35-year-old Terrell Daniels may have been the victim of a brutal homicide. He clearly hangs out with not a great crowd. If there was an intruder, possibly it was one of his uh, drinking buddies, his cocaine buddies, and, and maybe it would, they just got into a fight. Could be a gunshot wound in the back of his head. Hey, Tom, what? I thought I just clicked on the magnifying glass. Click on it once. Click on it once, okay. Yeah, maybe, exactly. I, maybe I'm clicking too much. Yeah, I'm maybe. clicking too much, okay. Now she's eager to see what the x-rays reveal. But unfortunately, it's a dead end. All right, that's, there's nothing. There are no projectiles in him. But just because I don't see bullets on the x-ray doesn't mean I can rule out foul play. We can't say for sure what's going on in his head. A blow to the back of the head's a possibility. I'm not going to be able to tell till I get inside. Did you take a picture of his neck? I took, um, I got the straight on and I got both sides. That's good. We reflect the scalp, uh, looking for bruises, and I don't see anything. He certainly doesn't have any skull fractures. We remove the calvarium, no trauma, and he doesn't have any subdural blood, which is blood over the surface of the brain. Okay, his head looks good. But despite the absence of any head trauma, homicide is still on Dr. G's list of possibilities. There's always that question about strangulation. I won't be able to tell for sure till I get in there. All right, let's see what else is going on. Dr. G makes the standard Y incision, eyes peeled for anything suspicious. I'm looking for subtle signs of hemorrhage under the skin. I'm looking for rib fractures. I'm seeing if there's blood collected in any of the body cavities. And I don't see any of that. So I can at least rule out trauma. Her next step is to collect blood samples for forensic analysis. This is a guy that we know has used cocaine, we know he abuses his prescription meds, and we know he's a drinker. So you bet my main focus is gonna be getting enough blood for toxicology. But even a rush job at the lab will take several days. So for now, Dr. G focuses her attention on Terrell's heart. His heart doesn't look that bad. The heart looks relatively normal. It doesn't look particularly big, and there was no abnormality to the valves or to the coronary arteries. So I don't see a clear smoking gun that his heart was his cause of death. But it's not long before Dr. G does uncover an abnormality in Terrell's lungs. It's very congested and heavy. He's congested everywhere. He's got fluid buildup in his lungs. But it's a non-specific finding, so we don't know why that is occurring. However, his lungs do help confirm Terrell's unsavory lifestyle. This guy's lungs are really bad. When I look at his lungs, I clearly know how he uses cocaine. He smokes crack cocaine. But nothing that would have killed him that day. Next. With Terrell's history of drinking in mind, Dr. G heads to the organ most likely to be damaged by alcohol abuse, the liver. Oh, that's gonna be heavy too. I see a fatty liver, kind of an enlarged liver and has a kind of a yellowish, almost greasy appearance to it. So he is in that spectrum of alcoholic liver disease, but it's certainly not to the point where we often see sudden death or complications from it. With no evidence of trauma or natural disease, Dr. G is still no closer to a cause of death. But I still want to look at the neck, because I'm a little bit worried that maybe he was strangled. So I do the dissection layer by layer, looking for subtle signs of hemorrhage. He doesn't have any. I don't have any evidence of strangulation. So we're going to check that one off the list. I can at least rule out foul play. <sighs> 
At this point, I'm frustrated because I still don't know why he died. But before Dr. G can wrap up the autopsy, she has one more organ to go. The only thing uh, I still have to do is the stomach. I often will wait uh, to the end to do that because it can be a messy uh, procedure. And at that moment, Dr. G spots something so alarming, she can hardly believe her eyes. Wow. What I found in the stomach was actually quite surprising. Oh my god, look at that. It's a piece of chewed kind of cellophane plastic. I was really shocked. This is bizarre. What could be going on with this fellow? Oh my gosh. Dr. G has just made the astonishing oh, discovery that 35-year-old Terrell Daniels has a piece of plastic in his stomach. Oh, look at that. It's exciting to see something you don't expect in an autopsy. I, as morbid as that sounds, you know, that's exciting for me. Do you want that, uh, you gonna laugh? Yeah, right. Focus on the top. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I may have the smoking gun. I think I know what this is. But I can't say for sure till I confirm it with the toxicology. So I send that off uh, to test to see if my suspicions are correct. And when I get the toxicology report, I've got my answer. I know what kills him now. And my hunch is right. From the start, Terrell Daniels' life has been a heartbreaking struggle with mental illness. His bipolar disease was diagnosed at a young age, and it clearly got worse over the years. Unfortunately, the combination of the depression and the mania with the alcoholism, with the drug abuse, drove his wife away. It made him lose the ability to see his child frequently. But despite his long history of addiction, Dr. G is stunned when she receives Terrell's lab report. When I get his toxicology back, he surprisingly has a very low level of alcohol and cocaine. But there is a drug in his system that is at a level that I know can kill him. He had a lethal level of fentanyl in his blood. Fentanyl is a strong prescription painkiller typically used by cancer patients. One of the ways that people take fentanyl for pain is by fentanyl patches. The drug is inside a piece of plastic which has a reservoir of fentanyl in it. And the patch is supposed to be put on the skin so you have kind of a chronic, uh, slow distribution to your body of that drug. For whatever reason, that's what this guy decided to abuse that day. And he somehow got a hold of a fentanyl patch. I don't even know if he's ever been prescribed this drug. People actually steal these fentanyl patches from trash cans of you know, healthcare facilities. So I don't know how he got his fentanyl patch. But Dr. G speculates that when Terrell first put the patch on his skin, he wasn't feeling the rush he anticipated. Fentanyl is very potent, but it actually doesn't give you as sharp a high as some of the other drugs. So he comes up with a new and dangerous way to increase the drug's effect. He liked that feeling of being up, of being uh, high. So he chews the patch and swallows it. What he had in his stomach was a fentanyl patch, but fentanyl is not made to be chewed and swallowed and it was too strong. The amount that he got in his system was too much for him. As the powerful narcotic enters his bloodstream, the effect on Terrell's body is devastating. Fentanyl is a central nervous system depressant, so it is slowly causing your brain to be depressed to the point where your breathing slows. 
This causes Terrell's oxygen levels to drop, and as a result, the lungs start to fill up with fluid. This is not a painful death. You slowly slip into a coma, and you stop breathing. And eventually, you die. He probably didn't have the knowledge that there's enough fentanyl in that patch to kill him. I don't think he meant to kill himself. For me, this is an accidental drug death. Dr. G immediately contacts the authorities to share her findings. Police are always happy when it's not a homicide. Uh, it's clearly less work for them. I never, though, uh, figured out why his window was broken. Uh, although that was highly suspicious for, for foul play, uh, it probably broke uh, at some point, and he just didn't have the wherewithal to even fix his window. This is Dr. Garvai at the medical examiner's office. All that remains is to reach out to Terrell's family. I think the ex-wife was saddened by the fact that it was really a stupid death. Um, but I think she was relieved that I didn't call it a suicide. She also knew the road he was on. You're not going to live long with that lifestyle. All right, you take care, OK? But Dr. G right, believes bye -bye. that Terrell's death may hold a valuable message for the living. People need to know the risk and benefits of these very powerful drugs. I doubt that I, though hard I try, could still remember all. If you don't use the drug as prescribed to a T, you run a risk. They lead you down a path of addiction, and they can cause death. They are not to be played around with. I've seen those shattered lives many times in this morning.